بكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيتها النفس المطمئنة ارجعي إلى ربك راضية مرضية فدخلي في عبادي ودخلي جنتي أمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم For the purification of the souls, the enlightenment of the hearts, the acceptance of our deeds and for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior, Ajallahu Ta'ala, Farajahu Sharif, enlighten your souls, purify your hearts with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Respected elders, dear sisters and brothers in Islam, Salamun alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. It is a dimension of the soul that is exclusively addressed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and spoken to in the Holy Quran. It's a beautiful state of the heart that you and I are recommended to strive for and achieve in this life. And one of its major applications is Sayyid al-Shuhada Aba Abdullah al Hussein, peace and blessings be upon him. An nafsul mutma'inna the tranquil, calm, peaceful soul is a state of the heart that is truly outstanding and excellent to achieve and establish as far as human beings are concerned. And it's a term that many of us have come across throughout our lives, perhaps through majalis, lectures, talks, through reading, books and articles. Often, an nafsul mutma'inna or the tranquil soul is referred to in the idea that many would come forward and seek this particular status of the heart and wonder, is it truly achievable? Is it something that you and I can attain in our lives? Because sometimes when you speak to many, they will tell you that they are facing so many challenges, obstacles, difficulties, hardships, that the notion of attaining a peaceful heart does not even cross their minds. In the idea that many human beings, perhaps at certain stages in their lives, go through troubled times, their hearts is unsettled, they're anxious, they're worried, they are constantly thinking about the next day and the repercussions of their actions. That is why they wonder, can I really attain a peaceful state when it comes to my heart or not. When it comes to the development of human beings, you and I recognize that we can certainly transcend. We can certainly achieve that which we think may not be achieved. How many times you've heard of individuals whom unfortunately have this defeatist giving up attitude, whereas there are those who have been successful who've recognized their potential, who've understood that with commitment, with hard work, with strong willpower, they are able to achieve many things that perhaps they thought they will not be. The success of the human being definitely lies within their hard work, but of course within the blessings and tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it is the Almighty who wants us to progress, to develop, to go forward, not to, trend, not to necessarily stagnate or become weaker as time goes by. That's why when you look around the world today, there is a dilemma and a huge problem that many people are facing. If you look, you examine that many different communities, societies, they complain. They complain of many aspects that make them unsettled, makes them worried in a major survey that was conducted indeed between December 2019 
and January 2020. Over 20,000 people were asked across the world in over 20 countries, representing different continents. And they were asked three questions. What are the three most worrying things in your life? 34% of the respondents said poverty, social inequality. 31% said unemployment. 30% said violence and crime. Of course, other respondents returned back with answers such as health care. Some, of course, returned back with religious discrimination and so on. Today, you can add another thing to this list. COVID-19. Without a shadow of a doubt, for many of us, it's troubling for our hearts. Many of us wonder, how can I be of the state of nafsul mutma'inna when I have to worry about coronavirus? When I am constantly told about what might happen and the restrictions that exist in society. There is a shadow of a doubt in the minds of many that indeed mental health, for example, is another major challenge that many people face in their objective to become better human beings. Perhaps they find obstacle after obstacle, financial hardship due to the unexpected nature of the current climate due to the worry regarding the future. And that's why people are desperate. People are seeking answers. People want illumination. They want motivation. They want inspiration. They want something to help them. They want a way out. They are seeking light so that their heart becomes peaceful and restful. Enter the Holy Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you and I knowing exactly our weaknesses and our strength. He knows what you and I need. He is the so-called engineer who has masterminded our creation. And therefore, he would provide for us at every opportunity in our lives, in every juncture, what is required to face all these hardships and challenges and difficulties. The Almighty Jalla wa Ala has not abandoned you and I. The Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala has not said, I will make you go through all this and I expect you to deal with it somehow. On the contrary, Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala has given us many tools. His blessings are abundant. And amongst, amongst His greatest favors and blessings to you and I, to be able to somehow seek this wonderful, beautiful, immaculate, brilliant state of the heart is the Holy Quran. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala has gifted you and I this error-free, sinless, immaculate words. The Holy Quran is the source of healing for you and I. Quran itself says, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ And we have descended and revealed from the heavens that which is a source of healing and mercy for the believers. When it comes to the Holy Quran, you recognize that Amir al-Mu'mineen wa Imam al-Muttaqeen Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi has a beautiful statement in this particular regard. He says, it is the Quran. If you ask it to speak, it will not do so. But I will tell you about it. Know that it contains knowledge of what is to come. Stories of the past, a cure for your ills, and a regulation of whatever faces you. Know that this Quran is indeed an advisor who never deceives, a leader who never misleads, and a narrator who never speaks a lie. Then he says something important in Nahjul Balagha. Whoever, whenever someone sits beside the Quran, when they get up, they will ha either have gained something or lost something. Either they would have been gained guidance or lost spiritual elevation and become blind therefore the holy quran presents us with the state and nafsul mutma'inna the state of the heart and indeed it's a state that we and i should be seeking how do i achieve it 
what kind of examples exist in history of those who had it? What are the obstacles? Why do people not look for it? What are the stages of the soul that I must understand and be able to prepare for so that I become of those who attain a nafsul mutma'inna in my life? So indeed I will be of the successful, happy individuals. And that's why the subject of discussion tonight is attaining a tranquil, peaceful, restful heart known as because when you look at the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about nafs, isn't it? In so many occasions. Over 240 times the word nafs and its derivatives are used in the Holy Quran. Yet you also find what is known as a ruh, the spirit. And many people think it is synonymous. Many think the ruh is the same as the nafs and the nafs is the same as the ruh. In English, the nafs is translated as the soul, but the ruh is translated as the spirit. Are they both the same or are they different? Indeed, when you look at the narrations of the Ahl al-Bayt, when you look at other verses of the Holy Quran, a different image or a picture emerges. What is that? There is a suggestion which is indeed quite acceptable by a number of mufassireen or ulama that the nafs is entirely different to the ruh. Ruh is a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the source of guidance for the nafs. What do we mean? The nafs is one that is blown into the human being by Allah. Jalla wa ala. It is a creation of his. The nafs is that which is, which is what? Which is detached from the body at the time of death and is carried during the alamul barzakh and it is then reintroduced into another body in the day of qiyamah. But the ruh, according to the understanding of some of our scholars, is what? Is a creation of Allah which is given to the nafs and somehow attaches itself to the nafs from the beginning and it is one that is pure that leads it's a compass that directs towards allah jalla wa ala. the stronger the ruh the more pure the nafs because the ruh is attached to the nafs when we are young the ruh is strong when we are babies and then into our childhood, our ruh is pure because the nafs is not polluted. It is not adulterated. It is not stained or contaminated. But as we progress in life, when we start committing sins and we do not seek repentance and penitence to Allah, the ruh becomes weaker in the sense that it starts to drift away from the soul. And when people who do not return back to God in sincere and earnest repentance and toba, the ruh becomes so distant that the soul becomes dark contaminated hardened and the human begins to practice and commit sin after sin that is a very interesting model that exists for us to understand in order to appreciate how i can attain that which is known as a nafsul mutma'inna i need to know that this nafs that seeks the energy the fuel the spiritual light from the ruh this ruh that is so powerful in the imams in the ma'sumin in the prophets and those who purify their souls are polishing the ability of the soul to encapsulate and to become surrounded by the ruh. However, the Quran also tells us that the soul itself goes through a number of different levels or statuses or degrees, depending on different philosophers, different theologians, different mufassirin who look at the three soul areas so to speak or dimensions that many of us no doubt have come across in order to understand can i attain a nafsul mutma'inna i need to appreciate and know what is known as a nafsul lawama and a nafsul ammara to besu yes a nafsul lawama is the reproaching dimension of the soul each and every human being has it yes what is it it is the alarm within us it is the warning sign that Allah wa ta'ala has gifted us. What a beautiful creation of Allah. You see, Rabbil Alameen has not abandoned you and I. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not left us to fight all the hardships and the shaitan just by living in this world. He's given us so many tools. And amongst those tools is this particular GPS system within us that somehow constantly nags, sometimes it, it, it rings and makes us feel guilty and remorseful. Not only when we 
are ought to be doing something right or when we do something wrong and when we have we should not have done it yes but when we miss an opportunity when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends us a path to take and we don't take it yes somebody wants our help for example I can volunteer in particular task for example I can do a righteous deed and I ignore it and I do not take this gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will feel inside uncomfortable. You will feel something telling you why you should have. Now this power within is known as what? An nafsul lawama. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by it in the Holy Quran after mentioning qiyamah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. La uqsimu bi yawm al-qiyamah wa la uqsimu bin nafs al-lawama. After swearing by the day of resurrection, accountability and measure, Allah swears by this dimension of the soul. Ulama of tafsir say, notice how it's important it is. If you want to be successful in qiyamah, do not neglect an nafs al-lawama. You ask me, can I neglect it? Of course we can. If we ignore it, if we don't listen to it, if we constantly press the snooze button in it, yes, just like an alarm, it will eventually become weaker. It will eventually not impact us as much. It will eventually not bring about the change or the warning signs. It's like our soul's immunity system. Think about it, yes? Our body's immune system gives us warning when something foreign that it doesn't like has what? has entered the bloodstream, for example, or it is within the body. Sometimes this immune system needs to be suppressed because it is what the physicians or the doctors want to do. However, in many cases, the immune system needs to be strong to defend the body against the ailments and diseases. And nafsul lawama seeks to return the human being to the right path. And that's why the Quran tells us of examples of people who listened to nafsul lawama and others who did not. The people of Ibrahim, this great prophet of God who is referred to 69 times in the Holy Quran and, in, and is addressed as Ummah in Ibrahim kana ummatan qanatan lillah. When he destroyed the idols of his people and he left the largest one and he placed the axe on the shoulders of the largest, of course. When people returned, they were angered, they were frustrated, they were raging with what with anger and they said to ibrahim man fa'ala hadha bi alihatina ya ibrahim ibrahim who did this ibrahim alayhi salam this great prophet of allah uses the power of the intellect reasoning dialogue he says to them think about it ask the, the biggest god of yours this stone that you have built in kanu yantqun if they truly are able to speak to you. You're worshipping them. Quran says, فَرَجَعُوا إِلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ That was the moment. The nafsu lawama now began to speak to them. Hold on, he's speaking the truth. How can we worship something that cannot even benefit us or harm us? We can't even communicate with it. But then they ignored it. They didn't pay attention to their reproaching soul. And so they said, no, we must punish you, O Ibrahim. Compare this with the magicians at the time of Prophet Musa When Musa السلام, demonstrated the will, the power of God through the miracle that his staff turned into a serpent Yes, these magicians immediately with no hesitation went into sajda That moment between what they saw in front of them and them being on sajda is when they listened to their nafsul lawama How did they listen? Well, their nurse told them, we are the experts here. We know if this is magic or not. And there is no way anyone can produce magic like this. It must be from a powerful being. And incidentally, they had watched Musa earlier. Because some people say, oh, did they immediately see this and all of a sudden believe? No. Before this great spectacle in which Musa and thousands of people were there and Pharaoh wanted Musa to be defeated and annihilated, they had observed Musa السلام, and some of them had seen the miracles of Musa in the courtyard of Fir'aun. Yet, Fir'aun told them, if you're successful, I will elevate your status. I will reward you. But they listened to that reproaching soul within them 
and therefore they were able to what they were able to be successful in dunya and akhirah yes they lived only maybe for a few hours but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises them and what they did in the holy quran therefore in order to attain an nafsul mutma'inna I must not ignore that voice within me that keeps telling me if I'm doing something right or something indeed wrong because it's a, a message from the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's a creation of the Almighty Jalla wa Ala. But of course, our main challenge, our main enemy within is what is known as an nafsul ammar to besu, isn't it? The dimension of the soul that ordains and commands towards evil. The dimension of the soul that is responsible for taking us and which shaitan plays on and potentiates. These are the two forces that make us commit haram, that make us not perform our wajibat, that make us commit atrocities or transgressions against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and indeed the people. And that is why the Quran comes forward and says, وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِي إِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَأَمَّارَةٌ بِالسُّوءِ إِلَّا مَا رَحِيمَ رَبِّي In chapter 12, Surah Yusuf, Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala says that I cannot be of the individuals who feel a sense of immunity, that I am okay, I won't be affected, I'm all protected, because every soul can be influenced by this نَفْسُ الْأَمَّارَةٌ بِالسُّوءِ You see, the Quran tells us there is a problem with human beings and that is their arrogance and their belief that many a times they're protected. Let me give you an example. I was discussing with a one particular lady recently. She's 16 or 17 and her parents were very concerned because she started to have a relationship with a, a, a member of the other gender on Instagram. When I spoke to her out of advice, I said, why are you doing this? She said, don't worry, nothing will happen. It's a very innocent, friendly relationship. What is going to happen in Instagram? You know, I know him, he knows me, we chat. No worries. Then I said to her, have you met? She said, well, yes, once. The idea that emerges is this is one of the tools of shaitan to give a false sense of security within the mindset of the human being. Many times in our lives, we're presented with these challenges, with these uh, opportunities to defeat satanic temptations. But shaitan tells us, you're okay, you're strong. You're a mu'min or a mu'mina. You wear hijab, you go ziyara, you attend majalis. You're okay, you're not going to fall into this trap. Go to the Christmas party at work. It's fine because you have to, you know, please your boss and everyone else. There is music, there is dancing, there is mixing. No problem. You have too much Iman. Let go a bit of it. Don't worry, you're protected. And so Shaitan gets, you have heard of this story of Barsisa. This Barsisa is referred to in the Quran according to Mufassirin, but not by name, yes? Barsisa is a story that many of us should remember if we are in those tempting situations, knowing that we're in a battle. Jihadun al-Akbar. This is against the nafsul ammara to bisu and the Shaitan, yes? This bigger struggle that the Prophet of Islam, when he returned, he said, I've returned from the minor uh, struggle, jihad, when he returned back from battle. And now I'm telling you all to face the biggest jihad. Yes, jihad nafs This jihad nafs is against shaitan, but also Ammar Abissu. Barsisa, according to Riwayat, he worshipped Allah for 60, 70 years, non-stop, and he was the best in his community as far as ibadah is concerned. The creme de la creme. The one who people looked up to, they said his dua is answered by Allah. They would come to him, he would ask Allah, his dua is answered. But can an individual become so sure of themselves that they're already there? That is the problem. That is the weakness that will turn the human being from a righteous individual to a doomed person. Yes, because this Barsisa... Different narrations tell us of what happened to him earlier. Some say he was worshipping and he saw somebody worshipping next to him. That person said to him, can I speak to you? Barsisa ignored him. But then Barsisa saw that he's worshipping God and his prostration is better than his own sajda. And he used to fast at least 10 or 20 days a month. And throughout the days he saw that this person is constantly in salah, constantly in ibadah, not eating. So he wondered, this person must be better than my, I am. So he began to speak to him. He said, very well, I'll speak to you. What is it that you wish? He said, nothing. I just want to be your companion. That's all. He said, very well. I would love to have a companion like you. 
They became friends. Barsisa is what? A man in his 70s. Yes, a man who is elderly. But he had a friend like this person. This person was one of the shaytans who had become into a human being. Yes? And the shaytan had, had a plan for Barsisa. He brought people towards him whom what? Who would uh, help. He would need to be helped. One time he brought three brothers who had a sister who was not well, who could not comprehend things. And these three brothers said, we cannot leave our sister with anyone more trustworthy than you because we are on a journey, we're going. And so, please look after her. Barsisa said, very well. So he had her in the room. Now shaitan comes to him. Not this individual, but the shaitan has now opened the heart of Barsisa. Why? Through listening to that individual whom he thought was an abid. Yes? And he started to compare himself with him. Now the thoughts came to his mind. This lady has no idea what's going on. Yes? She hasn't got any comprehension. You are an abid. You have committed so many acts of good service to the community. There is no harm if you what? If you do and enjoy yourself and what? Commit fornication. Very well. He, he did it. Then she became pregnant. Shaitan now comes and says, your reputation is on the line. You have to do something. Kill her and say she died naturally. He kills her. He buries her. The brothers come back after a, a while. They ask, where is our sister? Barsisa says she died. Now that shaitan who is in the form of human being now starts working. Yes? He goes to these brothers and says, by the way, did you check if this Barsisa is talking the truth? Why don't you dig the grave, exhume the body and see how was she killed? How did she die? Now they do that and they find that she was strangled. Then this Barsisa is what? Convicted in court. And he is about to be executed. When they were about to kill him, he was desperate. Shaitan appeared to him, yes, and said to him, what do you want? He said, I want to be saved. He said, just do sajda for me and I will save you. He lowered his head down and what? They lifted the rope. He lost this world and he lost Akhirah. In the recognition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, never, ever be in any state of immunity, whoever you are, whether you are marja'u taqlid and I know they are the most God-fearing of people, or whether you are a speaker, a scholar, a reciter, a community leader, an abid, an alim, anyone, any person, at any moment, at any second, you have been to 50 hajj, you have been to 500 ziyaras, you have prayed salatul layl every night. But it takes one thought and you could be on the path towards shaitan, isn't it? So this nafsul ammara to bisu is a nafs, that dimension of the soul that works tremendously uh, all the time to try and derail us. And that's why we need to adopt techniques to stand up against it. One of them is to develop willpower. Some people say, you know what, with the opportunity that we have with these phones, unfortunately we're bombarded with images, with clips that we're not supposed to look at. Sometimes, Molana, I don't want to look at these clips, but they come as suggestions. There are these so-called cookies. I don't know anything about these IT, but these cookies come up and you have to say yes, and therefore they know exactly what you want to do and where you want to go. And then they bombard you with advertising that you don't want to see on the streets, billboards, schools, colleges, work. It's everywhere, Molana. I don't know what to do. And that is why we need to learn and equip ourselves with tools to be able to stand strong against the nafsul ammara bisu. Let me give you one tool that is known as CAT, C-A-T, counter ambush training. What does that mean? That means you and I all have vulnerable moments in our lives. Shaitan knows it exactly, preys on it, yes? We have moments in which we are somehow subtly unexpectedly in certain instances or without knowing are sent trigger factors trigger factors that make us tend towards evil and haram you know yourself which ones they are if you don't identify it think about it when do i always unfortunately in certain circumstances watch that which i'm not supposed to or listen to that which i'm not supposed to or say that which i'm not permitted to yes now, in those instances, say for example you're bored at certain times, you pick up your phone, you go on YouTube, and then there is a thought in your mind that maybe I can watch this clip because it's a very appealing title. That is the moment that you need to remember what I'm about to say. Cat. What is counter ambush training? 
It is suggested, and this is a tool in you know, general uh, usage for willpower. It is suggested that at that moment, you make a decision between yourself, between you and what you're about to do, that you understand what your body is going through. Yes, there is a hormone that is released in the body called dopamine. It creates uh, a, a, an exciting feeling. There is an increased heartbeat. There is more, you know, you're breathing faster. Yes. Now, these are signs that you're about to do what you not supposed to do. Here it is said that one of the techniques is you convince yourself, I will not do it now, but I will come back in 10 minutes. 10 minutes. I'll come back. I'll do it. I'll click on that in 10 minutes' time. But don't say inshallah. It's haram. How can you say inshallah? Anyway, so although you could be at the presidential elections and use inshallah wrongly, but that's different. So the idea is what? You go 10 minutes and what? Hopefully that 10 minutes you are distracted and those 10 minutes you come to your senses. You begin to understand that this is wrong. You begin to be applying or doing something else which takes your mind away from what you are about to do. Try it. Yes? It can be applied on so many different aspects and it's not necessarily the only exclusive comprehensive tool. But there are so many like this in which you and I can adapt to be able to say no to our temptations, to our desires, so we can become stronger against al nafsul ammara to basu and the shaitan. That's why when you look at the verse in Surah Al-Fajr, chapter 96 of the Holy Quran, you recognize its importance. It's the last three verses of Surah Al-Fajr where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses this dimension of the soul and says, Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna. It is the only time in the Holy Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to the dimension of a soul. Only. He says, Oh, that soul, that tranquil soul, and addresses it in this beautiful way, in this very serene, calm, tranquil manner. How does this verse then go on to illustrate what the nafsul mutma'inna is? Because you pick up the books of tafsir and you read, and sometimes you find narrations that says, an nafsul mutma'inna is Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, Rudwanullahi ta'ala alayhi. Sometimes you pick up books of tafsir, commentary, and you find narrations such as that from Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad, al-Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi, who says, al-nafsu al-mutma'inna hiya al-Husayn ibn Ali, alayhi salam. The nafsu al-mutma'inna is Husayn ibn Ali, peace be and blessings be upon him. So you then wonder, if these individuals is what the Quran is referring to as nafsul mutma'inna, as a tranquil soul, can I also achieve this status or not? Here we have to understand the difference between ta'wil and tafsir. What does it mean? Briefly, there are so many things to say about this, but very briefly and in summary, tafsir is when the mufassir looks at the particular words of the holy Quran, of the ayah itself, and gives us the meaning. Looks at Arabic language, looks at Asbab al Nuzul, looks at it gives a general meaning of the tafsir. Ta'wil is the application, the interpretation which sometimes is applied to certain individuals. It doesn't necessarily mean that it is only exclusive in some cases, in many cases in the Holy Quran, to that application, but that application is the best manifestation of it. Because the Quran is for all of mankind, yes? So when the Quran comes forward and says what? And says, Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna, the idea emerges, and that is without a shadow of a doubt, amongst its greatest and most beautiful manifestations is Sayyid al-Shuhada. Peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny, as well as the holy prophet of Islam, as well as all the ma'sumin and the prophets, because truly they attained this wonderful, elusive state of the soul. Yes, when you see how they interacted, when they see how they dealt with hardships, difficulties, and calamities. And therefore, the Quran says, Irja'i. The first thing that the Almighty says to this calm, peaceful soul is, Come back. Why? You see, when I see something and I say it needs to be returned, would you understand? It used to exist somewhere and it needs to go back. When I say I have to return home, means I used to be at home. 
Otherwise, I wouldn't say I return to somewhere which I have never been or I do not belong. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, O oh soul, you do not belong to this dunya. This dunya is full of pollution. This dunya is full of distortion and darkness. Come back to the absolute perfect being. Come back and return to where you belong. Come back to tranquility, to happiness, to success, to that which whom guarantees you ultimate salvation. Return back to the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. But here it is very interesting that the Quran says, Irji ila Rabbiki, your own Lord. Yes, this is an expression of love. It's an expression of intimacy. It's an expression of connectedness and what? And proximity. Because towards the end of these sets, three sets of verses, the Quran says, Fadhuli fi ibadi wadhuli jannati. Subhanallah, Allahu Akbar. Hey, I recall Asiya bint Muzahim, Rudwanullahi ta'ala alayha, the wife of Fir'aun. Do you know when she supplicated to Allah? Most of us, when we supplicate, we say, Ya Allah, I want Jannah, isn't it? No doubt. And there is nothing wrong with that. We want paradise. Incidentally, translating Jannah in English is not heaven. Most people say, I want to go to heaven. In strictly Islamic terms, heaven means the, what? The skies, so to speak. Yes, Sab'a samawat. Whereas Jannah is paradise. Although, maybe it can be used interchangeably. Anyway. When Asiya says, Rabbibni li indaka baytan fil jannah. Ya Allah, I just don't want any paradise. I want this paradise that is close to you. Indaka. With you. Of course, there are some Urafa mystics who have come forward and said, we don't want jannah, we want Allah. Where they're mistaken is, you cannot have Allah outside of jannah. You must be in Jannah where you feel the love of Allah. And this is the epitome of al ishq al-ilahi. That the divine love that extinguishes all other kinds of love. So when the Quran says, come back, it means one of the characteristics and the hallmarks of an nafsul mutma'inna, the tranquil, peaceful soul, my dear sisters and brothers. It's its willingness to return. It means it is ready it means it's not desperate to stay in this world. It means it will prepare. It will work. It will endeavor to return back. And that is why you can see how Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam al-Muttaqeen, Qaid al-Ghurr al-Muhajjaleen, Asadullah al-Ghalib, Sayyidina wa Mawlana, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Salawatullahi wa Salamu alayhi. What a great manifestation of an nafs al Because the moment he is struck in the mihrab, Praying to Allah, he says, Fustu wa Rabbil Kaaba. That nafs is desperate to go back to Allah. I have become victorious by the Lord of the Kaaba. It was waiting. It was eager in the path of God, Allah, of course. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, of course, the verse, pre verses present to us key important qualities of what it takes to reach the status. Please follow with me because the following is of prime importance. We have established that you and I must make an endeavor and hard work and struggle and invest to ensure we reach an nafsul mutma'inna. It, it is not a dimension of the soul that is only for the elite, only for those who are the super, the best of the best. It is something achievable by you and I. And we must strive to achieve it even if we touch the surface or go through it at certain phases in our lives as long as we're struggling as long as, long as we are working hard Allah wa ta'ala will indeed help us and that's why you look at the verses that come forward and say O tranquil soul return back to your Lord with two important qualities please understand this you are pleased with Allah and Allah Jalla wa ala is pleased with you. This is a beautiful concept that is found 73 times in the Holy Quran. What is this concept? Ar-Rida. To be pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Please understand this because it's a vital, pivotal prerequisite for this soul that is not troubled, for this heart that is settled, 
that is calm, when there is tides, when they are what? Under so much stress and hardship and difficulty. Yet, Riva presents the key to you and I. And it is Riva, my dear sisters and brothers, that I address to myself first and to all my mu'mineen brothers and sisters that we desperately need at the era of COVID-19. The solution to our problems is satisfaction with God the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. The solution to all our hardships in this day and age is to be content with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The solution with all the challenges we face is to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me take you through a very brief journey of what this river actually means. What does it say in the Holy Quran that you and I need to do? How do I become pleased with Allah? What do I need to demonstrate in my life? Practically, I want to learn. I want to apply it in my life. I want to teach it to my children and my family. What do I need to do? The first level is to be pleased with Allah as the creator. What does that mean? That means when I think of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is the first thing that comes to our mind? It is recommended in the riwayah of the Ahl al-Bayt that when we recite the Adhan and the recitation is heard Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah we say, we actually say Raditu billahi rabba I am pleased with Allah as my Lord you declare it I am pleased with him and when it says wa ashhadu anna muhammadar rasulullah you say raditu bi muhammadin nabiyya and when the adhan says wa ashhadu anna aliyan wa liyullah say raditu bi aliyan wa liyya and then you name the imams this is established in the riwayat of the ahl al-bayt alayhim salam salam allah alayka ya amir al-mu'minin ya imam al-muttaqin what gems he has given you and i he describes what it means to be pleased with allah as the creator ilahi كفاني عزا أن أكون لك عبدا وكفاني فخرا أن تكون لي ربا أنت كما أحب فاجعني كما تحب يا الله it fills me with pride it fills me with strength that I am your servant and it fills me with pride that you are my lord you are exactly how I want you to be so make me how you want me to be this is أمير المؤمنين Yes, this is what you and I need to strive towards. Never in our lives, not even a split second, should we have any negative thoughts or ideas about the Creator, Allah wa Taala. Whatever happens in our lives, and I know it's hard, I know it's painful, I know it's excruciating sometimes, and I've heard it myself in the last six months during COVID. People say, "Why? Why is God doing this to me? Why is God afflicting me with this? I can't stand it. I can't take it." And it's happening. It's understandable to a certain extent. But we need to help ourselves and those around us. That's why when we become pleased with Allah as the creator, the next level to establish rida is to do the following. To be pleased with his legislative will and his generative will. Please understand the following. When you and I exercise rida with al-iradatu tashri'iyya lil-bari azza wa jal, what does this refer to? The Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent us the Holy Quran, has sent us prophets, has given us guides, imams. He has given us instructions, codes for you and I to practice. This is sharia. These are laws, do's and don'ts. A major characteristic of a person who is radhi, pleased with Allah, is that they are pleased with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them as far as obligations are concerned. And let me just elaborate on this. To be pleased doesn't mean when you do it and you do it, do it because you have to do it and you don't know why you're doing it and you're doing it, but you're full of rage within. You know, I've seen it, especially in the month of Ramadan. When people fast, you know, you ask them, how is it? I can't wait. I've seen it on Facebook and others. Three hours to go to iftar, two hours to go to iftar, ten minutes to go to iftar. Subhanallah, it's as if they're in prison. And then they think it's a punishment. Why is Allah punishing me? I miss my cigarette and my Costa coffee. I've now given an advert. In the idea that what? In the idea that people do not understand, in many cases, the philosophy and the basis by which certain rulings are given. 
And even if we don't understand what is so beautiful about the religion of Islam is the religion of submission. And I know Allah has created me. He knows what is best for me. And therefore, I must not only take it in, but I must be pleased with it. It's coming from Allah, the absolute perfect being who's compassionate, who's kind, who wants us to go to Jannah, who wants salvation for us. He wants us to earn it. It's okay that it's painful, but I am pleased because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only gives that which is khair and best. Whatever it is. Yes? That is why it's so fascinating when you look at examples in history. Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ismail alayhi salam. They are about to be what? Under severe examination. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I want you to kill your son. Quran says, Falamma aslama. They submitted. I ask you one question. Please reflect on this tonight. Did Ibrahim or Ismail ever come to Allah and say, Ya Allah, can we give you a suggestion? Can we slaughter something else instead, please? Can you? Is there a loophole? Is there a way out of this? Did Ibrahim ever object? Did he suggest something else? Does it make sense? Wallah, today, Allahu Akbar, one of the biggest challenges people like me are facing is the rising tide in the UK. Yes, without naming certain cities, and others of people questioning Islamic law. Questioning Islamic law. This doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. La'na in ziyarat Ashura. Doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. Ya akhi, this making sense. Where you bought it from? Yes, in the idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent it to us, if we have to make sense of everything, we cannot comprehend. We have to be of those who submit to the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. Follow the commands in the Quran and the Sunnah given to us by ulama. 1400 years of Ziyarat Ashura. Of course, the Quran is full of la'na, by the way, but that's a separate, separate subject. In the idea that existed today, we have to recognize that Imam al Hussein al Shaheed, peace and blessings be upon him, did he ever somehow say, Can I go somewhere else and fight Yazid? Can I be excused of this responsibility? Did he have a choice? Wallah, he had a choice. I swear by Allah, he had a 100% choice. He could have taken this mission and he could have rejected this mission. Did he ever say, you know, Ya Allah, can you please excuse me? This is not the right time. I'm going to lose my family. I don't think it's the right thing for me to go in Karbala, only about 100, 115, surrounded by 30,000. How does this make sense? Did he ever complain? Did he ever raise objection against the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala? That is riva. Yes? Sayyid al-Shuhada would say, what? Rivan bi qadaik wa tasliman li amrik. Most likely he said this, by the way, when he fell from the horse. Yes? He said, I am pleased with your decree and I submit with whatever you wish. This is the hallmarks of awliya Allah who have recognized the story of this existence. Yes, that is one way to look at it. When it comes to our ibadat, when it comes to wajibat, when it comes to the haram and halal, yes, to, uh, to stay away from haram music, to so perform salatul fajr, to wear hijab, not to have illicit relationships, and the list go on and on, isn't it? The more I am able to look at this fascinating, absolutely great equation, the more I will become nafsul mutma'inna. Because I'm pleased with the legislative will of Allah. That's the first part though. I need to also be pleased with the generative will of Allah. al iradatu taqwiniha And what does this refer to? This refers to what the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala makes you and I go through in life. For example, rizq. What he gives and what he takes away. There are those who constantly are unhappy in this world. They are worried and troubled. Because they find that they're not necessarily in the financial state that they want to be in an age of instant gratification. They want to see themselves in the same manner, in the same way as others. So they're always unhappy. They're always troubled. They're always worried. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has destined rizq for many of us. All of us, in fact. Because, you see, we have a beautiful hadith of Qudsi. He says to Prophet Dawood salam, He says, there are some amongst my servants, I have to keep them rich. Because if I make them poor, I lose them. And there are those amongst my own servants, who I have to keep them poor. 
Because if I make them rich, I lose them. Lose them means what? Allah knows that sometimes wealth is not good for us. We turn away from religion. We become arrogant. We start thinking that we are massive and we must be treated in a particular way and therefore start to distance ourselves from the Almighty Jalla wa'ala. Look at, for example, other forms of trials and tribulations, such as illnesses, for instance. Yes. When an individual is going through illness, narrations tell us if only they knew the extent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy that is befalling upon them, they would have asked Allah, Ya Allah, keep me ill all my life. Because it's a challenging time. This doesn't mean that they should not seek help or rem remedy or medication, no. It means that they stay patient, subservient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, pleased with whatever he has made them go through. That is truly remarkable state of tranquility. When a human being recognizes that everything is in his hands, he gives and takes part of a very complex, wise plan that I may not know about. But it is short term. It is transient. It will not last forever. But the question that some people may have is, why do people then not exercise riva? Given that they need to be pleased with the legislative will of Allah and the generative will of Allah, yes? Which requires a lot more discussion, but this is tip of the iceberg. One reason, my dear sisters and brothers, is because somehow, sometimes we feel that we are obliged over God. Meaning, Ya Allah, why are you treating me this way? I am praying, I am fasting, I am giving my khums and zakat, I am doing what is wajib. Why do I have to go through what I go through? Remember, Allah is the owner. Who are we to hold him accountable? How can we have the audacity to say to Allah, Ya Allah, why are you doing this? قُلِ اللَّهُمَّ مَالِكَ الْمُلْكِ He is the owner of all things. He is the king of kings. يُؤْتِ الْمُلْكَ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَنْزِعُ الْمُلْكَ مِنْ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَعِزُّ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيُذِلُّ مَنْ يَشَاءُ He gives dignity, he disgraces. بِيَدِهِ الْخَيْرِ It is in his hands. We are not owners. Whatever I have is not mine. If you think for a split second that everything that you have from possessions, from health, from wealth, from family is yours, you're mistaken. This all belongs to Allah. Therefore, when it belongs to Allah, He could take it any minute. Who am I to object to it? Who am I to say, Ya Allah, why are you doing this? It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to Him. Second reason why sometimes we're not grateful or we're not in the state of rida is because we live in a society that's based on comparisons. We have comparison sites for insurance. We have comparison sites for plumbers. We have comparison sites for everything you can think of. Hotels, everything you want to buy or purchase or a service, you go through comparison sites to see what is the best product that you get, isn't it? It's not necessarily a bad thing. And this mentality sometimes creeps into us because we see others having what we don't have and therefore we begin to compare our lives with others. And therefore we begin to think, if somebody has X, Y, and Z, why do I not have? Why am I not in the same state as that particular individual? What's wrong with me? Why am I not fortunate enough or blessed to be in the state like that other individual? And therefore, my dear sisters and brothers, we are invited as individuals, as human beings, as servants of Allah to take this journey. These are all reflections for us to reflect upon, upon the immaculate nature of the state that we can acquire. And I remember, may Allah bless the soul of all our ulama, including one of the great scholars that I had the honor and pleasure to meet when I was young as a child. Ayatullah al-Uzma al-Imam al-Sayyid Ruhullah al-Musawi al-Khumayni. Rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi. Imam al-Khumayni, some stories about him that truly he had this dimension of nafsul mutma'inna. It is said that once when he was coming back to Iran after the victory, and there were reporters in the plane, one of the reporters, probably CNN or some other American outlet, asked him, how are you feeling? You have just toppled a massive regime. You are now establishing this state. How are you feeling? What's your feeling? And the Imam replied in Farsi, Heech, nothing. 
because you want me to say I'm excited, it's an amazing day, whatever, whatever. What he's trying to say is my heart is so tranquil and peaceful. What matters is what pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I have got to strive. I don't know what pleases the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala, but I've got to keep hard working. Yes. In another occasion, he was sitting in a gathering. They came to him. They said that there is what the invasion, the country has been invaded by the wretched tyrant Saddam. He just stood up and went to perform salah. Did not react, did not shout, what are we going to do? Are we panicking? This country, calm. That calmness, that oasis of serenity is a beautiful hallmark of so many of our ulama who've grasped these secrets. It is possible, my dear sisters and brothers. Why? Because we have Ali Muhammad. And these individuals... They are the manifestation of Rida. They say, Rida Allah, Ridana, Ahl al Bayt. The pleasure of Allah is the pleasure of us, Ahl al Bayt. The satisfaction of Allah is the satisfaction of us, Ahl al Bayt. In the sense that you want Allah to be pleased with you, then look at these individuals, how they live their lives, how satisfied they were with the Almighty, Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. Yes, one after the other. Yes. The, uh, the Holy Prophet of Islam, peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny. When he would be pelted by stones in an area known as Ta'if, yes? He would sit there, his legs, blessed legs, hands bleeding. And, you know, he would raise his hands. And he says, as long as you are pleased, la ubali, not really concerned. This doesn't worry me. As long as you are pleased, that is what my concern is, yes? And you look at each and every one of the Ahl al-Bayt, alayhum salam including Sayyid al-Shuhada, on so many instances, what made him able to physically deal with the masa'ib was the fact that he had this tranquil heart, and nafsul mutma'inna, yes. When he held this young six-month-old baby of his, and it's so painful, as a father, and so many of those watching and attending and listening to this majlis who are fathers and mothers will know that as parents, it is so crucial that we look after the well-being of our children. And if they're hurt in any way, we feel deep pain inside. I ask you, if they're ill, we are troubled. What happens if you hold your son with an arrow cutting through his neck? What goes through the mind and the heart? What did this young boy do to deserve this? Why should a man who is the grandson of the Prophet have to see such a crime? Have to see such bloodshed, such barbarism? Why? But you know what Sayyid Shuhada said? He said, Hawwana ma nazala bi annahu Allah. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made me go through, I am pleased with because he is watching. Because he knows what I am going through. So it gives me the strength. I ask you, when the verses say, Radiyatum Mardiya, whom amongst the Ahl al Bayt is given these two names? Sayyidatun Nisa, the Lady of Light, Fatima. She is known as the one who is pleased with Allah, and Allah is pleased with her. She is a radiya al mardiya Allahu Akbar. The masaib that Sayyidatul Nisa Fatima went through throughout her life breaks the heart, especially when she lost her beloved father, especially the crimes that were committed against her, especially the atrocities that they inflicted upon the apple of the eyes of Rasulullah. What more painful it is than to lose a child, and not a normal child, a child whose father is Ali and whose mother is Fatima to actually cause a miscarriage is a crime is murder 
But to kill that young baby, unborn baby, is a crime of huge repercussions. Yes, Sayyidat nisa Fatima would lose her muhsin. Here, I would like to somehow recall how a pop poet brought about a conversation between the two babies slaughtered. One in Medina, one on the plains of Karbala. They are about to speak to each other. One narrates to the other the masaib. One tells the other what they felt, what they went through. Yes, uh, Muhsin says to Ali and Al Azgar, he says, Oh, nephew, let me tell you what they did to me. Uh, you were able to see your mother for the last time. Your eyes set itself and gazed upon your father, Abba Abdullah. But they never gave me a chance to see my mother and father. Oh, Ali and Al Azgar, you were able to be carried by your mother and father. The only time my mother carried me was when I left this world. I never felt her warmth, I never felt her love because I was a lifeless body when she embraced me at that moment Allahu Akbar then Ali al-Azhar says oh my uncle Muhsin you felt a nail towards your chest I felt an arrow through my neck oh Muhsin oh Muhsin you were looked after in the womb of Sayyidatun Nisa I was thirsty thirsty I begged for water I was desperate for water instead of quenching my thirst they slaughtered me from one way to another Allahu Akbar yes Oh, Muhsin, oh, Muhsin, you had your father to bury you. I had no one to bury me. I was there on the place of Karabala. I saw, I saw what I saw from the calamities on the 10th of Muharram. Allahu Akbar. Yes, Sayyidatun Nisa, Fatima al-Zahra, she would lose her beloved. Mohsin, that would eventually lead to her martyrdom, that will eventually lead to her leaving this world. When Amir al Mu'mineen buried his beloved Fatima, he sat there looking at the grave of Rasulullah. He said, My beloved Rasulullah, I've returned your amana towards you. She left very quickly after you. Allahu Akbar. What heart, Amir al Mu'mineen? One musiba after the other. Yes. Then he fell asleep on the grave of Fatima. When he fell asleep on the grave of Fatima, he saw his beloved wife. She saw him in the dream. She says, Ya Abel Hassan, I ask you to do one thing for me. He says, My beloved Fatima, what do you want me to do? She says, Zainab has just woken up. She's asking for her mother, Fatima. Don't leave Zainab alone in the house. Oh, Abel Hassan, go and wipe the tears from the eyes of Zainab. Imam Amir al Mu'mineen rushes towards Sayyidah Zainab. I say to him, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, who wiped the tears from the eyes of Zainab when she stood to see Shimmer sitting on the chest? لا لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين وإنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون We continue to get requests from mu'minin and mu'minat There is a, a mu'min who's having an operation tomorrow A life-threatening situation let us raise our hands. These are special nights. Our hearts are in Karbala with Zuwar al-Husayn in Arba'een. 
We may not be with them in person, but certainly we are with them in spirit. Let's raise our hands. Let's pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, shifa mu'mineen and mu'minat, including the mentioned marir with the recitation of five times of this ayatul mubaraka for shifa. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Amman yujibu al mudtar idha da'ah wa yakshifu al su. Amman yujibu al mudtar idha da'ah wa yakshifu al su. Amman yujibu al mudtar idha da'ah wa yakshifu al su. Amman yujibu al mudtar idha da'ah wa yakshifu al su. أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء يا الله شافي مرضانا بحق مريض كربلا زين العابدين تقبل منا هذا القليل وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات ومن ماتوا على الإيمان وإلى أرواح العلماء والشهداء وخدمة الحسين رحم الله من قرأ الفاتحة but before it 